Welcome to the Peak Mental Performance Podcast with Joe Shalero, optimizing your mental health and athletic performance one episode at a time. One. And all right, welcome back everybody to another episode of the Peak Mental Performance Podcast. I have with me today Ben Hartman. He has a bachelor's degree in exercise physiology, a master's degree in nutrition and dietetics with a special research emphasis on sports nutrition and supplementation. He's competed in bodybuilding for years, he's also competed in powerlifting and strongman, and he is the owner of Morphogen Nutrition. Uh, thanks for being here today, Ben. Thanks for having me, Joe. Absolutely. So I've known Ben for probably eight or nine years now almost. And um, he, when he started his company, we were just talking about uh, before this started about six or so years ago, um, I had the opportunity to kind of be there and hear a lot of the thought process of why he started his company. At the time, he was a sponsored bodybuilder with one of the larger companies in the country. And a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today about uh, kind of navigating dietary supplements and how you evaluate if you evaluate if something's going to be worth the money, if it's going to be effective um, to make sure you know what you're actually getting. A lot of those things are the reason Ben started his company. And, you know, there's probably a short list of people in the dietary supplement and even nutrition industry that I feel like have really good integrity with why they want to do what they do. And Ben is one of them. So that's why I wanted to have uh, him on here to talk today. So, so, um, for Ben to kind of kick things off, you know, what kind of led you to start your company? Yeah. Uh, so like you said, I was sponsored by one of the bigger companies actually in the world at the time, uh, back before many companies gave out a lot of sponsorships. Um, I was lucky enough to have some connections in the industry and I had a pretty good, uh, rapport, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, scientific information and logical and intelligent approach to contest prep uh, and that kind of stuff. And so they brought me on to be a representative for their company, and that entailed, you know, product demos and working the Arnold Classic. And, you know, they, they paid for some of my competitions that I did. Um, and this is one of the probably more, uh, probably one of the better respected companies in the world in terms of what they put out on the market. And I was still looking at some of their formulas going, this makes no sense. You know, either either they hit everything in a proprietary blend, which means you have no clue what you're getting. So how can you possibly know that it's going to be an efficacious product? Or they put things in there that either don't make sense given make sense given the the goals of the formula, or they're just not in the right dosing. And here I was, somebody that considered myself to be an academic in the field, and I was representing them and getting all these questions, and they would, and people would say, you know, you know. Tell me about XYZ ingredient. You know, I see here that there's 500 milligrams in the product. Is that a good dose? And I would say, well, you know, the research shows that you need, you know, 3,000 milligrams to have the, the maximal benefit. I'm not sure why they put 500 in there. Uh, and you can see, you know, that's kind of a conflict of interest with with my integrity and with what I believe in. And frankly, I was, I was tired of doing that. Um, right. And I, you know, like I said, I had a bunch of connections in the industry over the years that I had made. And I... I knew a little bit about the manufacturing process. I knew quite a bit about the science, um, and I was pretty confident that I could put together some formulas, at least in the beginning, that would supersede anything that was on the market. Proper dosing, uh, full disclosure that I full disclosure on the label. You know, you didn't need to buy extra ingredients. You didn't need to buy a secondary product and, and mix them together. You know, things like that that I that just bothered me back in the day. So, I uh, I took. Basically, all of our savings, my wife and I's savings, and drained it down to 10 bucks. Uh, she's not too thrilled about me sharing that information, but it is what it is. <laughs> so literally, we drained our savings down to, I think it was like $10.60 or something for well over a year uh, because I dumped everything into the company right out of the gate, uh, launched our flagship product, Alphagen, which is our pre-workout. We had one flavor. We bought one batch. We did all the licensures and all the you know legal stuff, and a few months later, we had product – I'll say on the shelf, but we had product ready for the consumer. Uh, one thing that we did, though, with the formation of our company is we wanted to be primarily a direct-to-consumer business model uh, for two reasons. One is that I always say say to people, you know, I'm not a businessman. I'm a science guy. I'm an athlete. I'm an athlete. I'm somebody that's passionate about, a, about what we do, but I'm not a salesman, and I don't know how to run a business. So the last thing I'm going to do is – 
take on partners and investors and gamble with other people's money and create product that is designed to be flooded on the market on a wholesale level. You know, it gets into retail, you know, into retailers, the retailers sell it to the consumers. Everybody has a margin that gets marked up a certain amount and everybody makes money off that. But ultimately, the quality of the product is diminished. Um, the other reason we want to do direct to consumer related to that is that instead of me creating a product for five dollars and selling it to a distributor for 10, who sells it to a retailer for 20, who sells it to a consumer for 40. I wanted to create a product that I couldn't even sell to a retailer for. You know, Why not make right. a product that costs five times as much as anybody else is making, put full dosing, put every ingredient that you could possibly want in that formula to elicit the maximum benefit, the maximum benefits of whatever that formula is designed for, and then sell it to the consumer for a fair, direct price. So they're getting a comparable price point on a product, but they're getting something that is intrinsically valued at so much more, so much more. Uh, the other thing that we ended up doing with that is no hidden fees at checkout, no tax, no shipping and handling fees. We cover all that in the continental United States. And that way, when somebody's putting together a supplement budget, the price you see on our site is the price you get. So yeah. if you're budgeting $100 a month, you can buy $100 a month and, and get two to three incredible products. And you know exactly what you're getting, and you know exactly, and you know exactly how much each scoop costs, and and the value is there uh, more than what you would get from a mainstream company at a local mom and pop supplement store or a or a big chain, you know, like a GNC or a vitamin shop. So, yeah, it makes sense. And I think, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here is to kind of give people an idea of how that even the business side of it works a little bit because. You know, my goal of this is not to just have you on tell everyone, all right, go spend all your money with Morphogen. But the, I think people have to understand that, like, if you really think about the nuts and bolts of how supplement costs work and how the companies work, it's like if you're buying something cheap from a retailer like GNC, you have to question how cheap they were able to get ingredients into that product because, you know, like you said, if essentially the company has to sell it to the, you know, distributor, the wholesaler, and then they sell it to that, a retail store and then they mark it up and if you still buy it for 30 bucks or even 30 bucks well how cheap are the ingredients that they put in there you know yeah it's, exactly. it's hard to it's hard to get a you know unfortunately like with most things it's like you get what you pay for and if it's too good to be true it probably is so yeah i mean it, absolutely especially when you look at um you see a lot of companies now these bigger companies have similar branded lines of product but they are they're cheaper versions and you see them at um places like bj's or costco or sam's club or walmart um you can't buy five pounds of whey protein for thirty dollars anywhere you probably can't even make it for thirty dollars so if you're finding that at a store you have to question the quality of the product that's that's on the shelf considering the markup involved across the board. Um, typically, when you look at those types of products, you notice less protein per scoop, more fillers, uh, less active ingredients, more flavoring agents, because they're designed for the a mass population that doesn't understand the industry and is driven by price and driven by price and flavor. And unfortunately, even the people that are in the industry that purchase products regularly are largely driven by price price taste and i'll say you know marketability or the, the marketing hype behind that product so it's it is a little bit disheartening to see people get duped um i'm okay with somebody paying top dollar for a quality product at a gnc or a vitamin shop if that product is in fact a premium product uh but most of the time you have mediocre products with less than efficacious dosing but what a lot of people don't understand is that at most retail stores there are usually some sort of incentives to sell a certain product, whether that be the owner wants the person to sell it because they make the most margin on that product. So the salesman goes, oh, this is the best. You should buy this. Well, they're telling you that so that the store can make the most money. The second thing is that a lot of these companies will actually give a kickback to the salesman themselves, to the employee themselves. So, you know, you know, let's say XYZ company is at a GNC. If John Smith sells their product, he gets $5 commission from XYZ company every time he sells one. So when you go into these stores, the odds that they have the consumer's best interest in mind is pretty slim because the entire industry is driven by margin. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, kind of on that note of, you know, say somebody walks into a store, they're looking online and they look at 
a, you know, a nutrition label on a supplement. And, you know, I think based on some of the conversations we've had and even, you know, more that I've looked into it myself, it's like companies have gotten pretty good at finding ways to, uh, you know, make it look like you're getting a ton of something when you're really not. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, we've talked about before, but what are some ways that, you know, when you're first glancing at a nutrition label, you kind of have to do maybe even a little bit of math yourself or you have to look a little deeper to make sure you're actually getting what you want to be, what you want to be getting. Yeah. The first big red flag is a proprietary blend. So if a company lists any number of ingredients, uh, in a hidden blend that to me, that is a huge red flag run for the Hills. Uh, usually what happens in a proprietary blend is they underdose some of the more expensive raw materials and they potentially overdose some of the less expensive raw materials. Uh, case in point, there's a lot of, let's say, amino acid formulas on the market. Some of them have um, maybe taurine or glycine or alanine way high up on the list in a proprietary blend. Well, those amino acids are so, so cheap to manufacture that it might literally cost that company 2 to $3 to make that jug where you're reading down on the label and you might see further down on the list maybe L-leucine or L-citrulline and these other things that have a, a tremendous benefit, but those things need to be in high doses. Um the other thing is, thing is, and I and I'd like to say there's a slow trend towards this, but we need more informed consumers. So the research is out there. It's very easy to go to examine.com or do a PubMed search and find five studies on you know let's use citrulline you know as an example. Citrulline needs, you know, somewhere between six and eight grams of either L-citrulline or citrulline bound to malic acid, which is called citrulline malate. So six to eight grams is the efficacious dose for the performance benefits and for the blood flow or the pump benefits. But if you see a scoop that weighs five grams and citrulline is 10th down on the list, well, one, it's, it's not even feasible that they can put six grams of citrulline in a five gram scoop. But the other thing is that it's so far down on the list, you might get milligram quantities, which means it's not going to do anything. Right. So the, the, the consumer is going to have to take an informed approach to figuring out, you know, at least what the basic, at least what the basics of the ingredients are and what the dosages should be. And the other thing, like I said, is proprietary blends are the big red flag. Um, I would, I would run for the Hills. Uh, another thing off the top of my head that companies do is they will list a, a raw extract amount, but they will use the active ingredient dosage. So let me explain. So let's say, um, what's a good example here? Let's say Yohimbine, Yohimbine HCL, okay? The dose needs to be somewhere around uh, 20 milligrams for a 100 kilogram person. So you and I, you know, in the 220 to 230 pound range, need about 20 milligrams of Yohimbine HCL to, to do its magic. Some companies will take Yohimbi bark and they will put 20 milligrams in the product. But Yohimbi bark might only have 5% Yohimbine per serving. So that, 20 mil so that 20 milligrams might only yield, you know, 100 micrograms of active Yohimbine, which means it's useless. So what they're doing is they're confusing the bulk agent that contains an active ingredient with the actual active ingredient doses dosage right. um there's a there's a, a new fat burning compound that we have uh in one of our our products called paradoxine and it's an herb similar to ginger paradoxine is another one that people are confusing the dose paradoxine contains 12 and a half percent what's called six paradol which is the active compound that elicits thermogenesis uh research shows that you need somewhere between maybe 35 and 50 milligrams of six paradol a day to burn fat well, at 12.5%, that means you need somewhere in the 180 to 450 milligram range of paradoxine to yield the 35 to 50 milligrams of 6-paradol. Unfortunately, what these companies are doing is they're taking bulk paradoxine and they're only putting in 40 milligrams in their product because it, to the consumer that doesn't understand that, they're going to go, well, I read you need 40 milligrams, need 40 milligrams, and theirs says 40 milligrams. Theirs is 40 milligrams of something that only has 12% actives, which means right. you're only getting 3.5 milligrams of actives not 40. So they're literally putting in one tenth the dose that you need. Well, one tenth the dose of the dose means one tenth of the price. And when you have an expensive raw material like that, that might cost four or five dollars per bottle just for that one ingredient. It now costs that company 40 cents per bottle to manufacture it instead of four dollars. Yeah, it's 
it's a very, uh, you know, you see it with a lot of different products. I think people get very confused and they take advantage of the fact that I think part of it too is like a lot of, say, like mainstream uh, companies that have articles that come out, whether it's like a Livestrong or Men's Fitness or something, they'll just kind of generally refer to something, some sort of ingredient. So then people get used to going to the store and just if they see whatever they saw in the article, they assume that's the same thing. But even, I mean, there's even easier, even, I mean, there's even ingredients where they have to look at the type of that same ingredient, you know, even, you know, you go to a store, you look at like magnesium or something. It's like, there's a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, hundred different kinds. Yeah. You have to look at like, what type am I actually getting? Is it even bioavailable and things like, it's not that, you know, based on your budget, based on how much money you have, based on what your goals are, you have to decide what you want to utilize. But at least make sure that if you're going to spend the money that you're actually getting what you think you're getting. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, it, it, is a, it is a tough industry. Being an informed consumer is tough. Not everybody has advanced degrees in physiology and nutrition and biochemistry. We understand that. Uh, like one thing that our company has is detailed, without being too detailed, explanations of every ingredient that you get. So when you go to our product page and it says, you know, hey, we can we have, you know, DMAE by tartrate. Here's what it is. Here's what it does. Here's what the research says the dose should be. And here's how much we put in a scoop. Simple. If you go to some of these companies, they don't explain anything. There is no explanation. There's a bunch of you know, wow, it'll knock your socks off, lightning bolts and, you know, skull and crossbones and all these fancy marketing things, but they're not, ed- things, but they're not educating the consumer on what their product actually contains or actually does. Um, it's just, it's, it, it is a cutthroat industry. And like you said, cheap is cheap. And if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah, absolutely. And the, I think like what you mentioned there, understanding, cause you know, I think the terms like research and science just get like thrown onto things because people see it and they go, oh, it's science-based. It's yeah. Like, well, what does that mean? And what is the, like, if you're going to look at the, you know, if there's something that's quote unquote research supported, it's like, well, yeah, but what dose were they using in the research versus Correct. what's actually in the product? Um, yeah. And I mean, I've even had, a, I've been having a lot of discussions lately with people about even things like, you know, like I think a hot thing right now is like CBD oil because it's essentially a legal component of marijuana that people, you know, that companies are taking advantage of the fact that it's legal to to sell it at a pretty high price. But I've been talking to more people, talking to more people and looking at more research where it's like the amount of milligrams that they use to get therapeutic response in some of the research is like a hundred times what you could even possibly use out of one of these dropper bottles that you buy. And Correct. I think you see oh, yeah. that. You see that in a lot of products where it's like, like the um, they, they we're pumping these rats so full of this stuff that like you're not getting that same amount in the little bottle of pills that you buy from no, GNC. No. Well, and the thing is too is is generally speaking, you want to find ingredients that have human data to support them. I'm yeah. not against rat or mouse data on a supplement, but people have to realize that pound for pound or gram for gram, we're not the same as mice and rats. And so there's actually conversion charts available where if a company, you know, if research says that a rat needs, let's say a hundred milligrams per kilogram of body weight, that doesn't mean you need a hundred milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Um, you know, I, if it's, let's say if it's a rat, you take that hundred and you divide it by hundred and you divide it by around six. And if it's a mouse, you divide it by around 12. So if it's, if let's say it's a, a rodent model, let's say it's a rat model, you take the 100, you divide it by 6, you get around 15 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Well, if you weigh 100 kilograms, now that means you need 1,500 milligrams or 1.5 grams of active ingredients. And, but like you said, you'll get companies that are, that'll take research and it says, you know, clinically validated ingredients. Well, maybe the ingredients are clinically validated, but then they'll put 50 milligrams in the product. Right. So they're literally putting in 1 30th of the dose that's going to do anything because the consumer sees a buzzword, they see the words clinically validated or clinical, you know, ingredients. It, the word clinical and the word science are, are bastardized these days, and it doesn't almost mean anything because, you know, they'll say clinical dosing. Well, yeah. here's an example. So clinical dosing, the branched chain amino acids, okay? All the research on branched chain amino acids done on muscle protein synthesis, protein synthesis and recovery and performance and all these things. It's a two to one to one ratio of leucine to isoleucine to valine. Okay. There are companies that are putting 10 to one to one and calling it clinically validated dosing. Well, one, that's not clinically validated. 
It's, it's nowhere in the literature to be found. They're making it up. Two, they're doing that for two reasons. One, leucine is a buzzword. So people think, oh, there's more leucine. That means it's better. When in reality, it probably is not. Right. And number three is leucine compared to the other two branched chain amino, uh, amino acids is actually cheaper to manufacture. So if you put 10 grams of product in a scoop and you hedge your bet adding more leucine and less of the other two, it's a cheaper scoop, which means it's a cheaper tub, which means margins are higher, which means back into that distribution model. Now you have you know, manufacturers and supplement companies and distributors and retailers all getting rich. And a consumer yeah. is buying a product now that doesn't offer the same benefits, doesn't have any clinical validation, any clinical validation in it whatsoever, and it potentially could even be, I'll say, harmful to what their goals are, not necessarily physically harmful, but it, it might not be an optimal product, which means they're wasting their money. So it's it really is uh, kind of disheartening to see you know the science being bastardized so bad. Yeah, and I, and. You know, and I'm far from an expert on this, but I've even, you know, read and heard a little bit about, you know, I, I think a lot of times they'll use something like certain amino acids and list them as added as like in a way that marketing looks like a bonus, but they actually could be using that to just spike the like nitrogen content and stuff. Oh, yeah. Right? Well, protein powders are notorious for doing that, especially the, like I said, the ones that you see at like the big, the big bulk stores, you know, the, the uh, Sam's Club and the BJ's and the Costco's and those sorts of places. Um, a lot of these companies have been getting busted for that. They're getting in trouble, and that's a good thing. But basically what they were doing is they were putting in nitrogen, nitrogen sources that would test positive as a protein on a lab assay, but they're not part of protein, and they have nothing to do with protein synthesis. Right. Again, I, mean, you know, I mentioned earlier cheap amino acids, things like taurine, glycine, alanine, things that potentially don't do anything um, and are dirt cheap, and they don't taste like anything, so they're easy to put in a, in a formula – and make it cheap to manufacture, and people think they're getting 25 grams of protein, and in reality, they're getting 10. Yeah, it's, 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 the more you learn about that stuff, the more you're like, man, it's, it can feel overwhelming, but like you said, I think the goal is you just try to, if you can find products that have simple labeling to where you can sit down and really, you know, if it takes you five or 10 minutes to do the math and make sure you're getting the right thing, it's like you're going to spend your hard-earned money. You might as well Absolutely. do that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, and the thing is, you know, what's the value of your time, you know? I think most of us would would be able to say, oh, you know, I would I would spend an hour to make $25 or $30. You know, that's that's a good amount of, amount of value per time. But they won't sit down and put an hour of research into a product that costs them $50, yeah, like you're going to spend fifty dollars on a product, you should sit down for two hours and research it. And better yet, you should be able to go to that company's website and find all that information out from them. Right. So go to the website and look at the ingredient list and say, "Hey, I don't understand what this ingredient is. Oh, there it is. Oh, there's the explanation. Oh, there's what the research says it should be. I, I get it now. You know, there should be an educational component to, uh, you know, marketing these supplements." to the consumer. Yeah. And definitely. the companies that aren't doing it are not doing it for a reason because they're hoping for illogical, uh, emotionally based decision making, you know, on the part of the consumer and not an informed consumer taking the time out of their day to educate themselves. They're, they're preying on the weak essentially. Yeah, definitely. And the, definitely. And the kind of a last point on the ingredients, uh, and kind of efficacy type thing. There's also, I think another big one, is people understanding when there's certain ingredients that or certain compounds or whatever that they may have worked in research but it's also important to understand what can actually be ingested orally to work versus absolutely what was given say intravenously or intramuscularly in research because i mean there's certain things that you could take as much as you want of it's not going to cross the blood brain barrier yeah oh yeah so, or uh you see that a lot with um like growth hormone precursors mm-hmm where, you know, they'll be like, oh, L-arginine and L-orthine increase, you know, growth hormone levels 10,000%. Well, they were, they were injecting that into them. You can't do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, and even if you could, is that 10,000% increase or 5,000 or what, you know, whatever the number is, is that going to lead to a real world change in the outcome, in the outcome? Just because you can raise your growth hormone levels 500% from ingesting glutamine or something doesn't mean it's going to actually do anything in your physique. Those numbers are, are a little misleading too, because when they say five hundred percent, they don't mean five fold over the baseline. They don't mean yeah. it goes from from 
you know, 100 to 500. What that means is that it's a 500% increase compared to placebo or, you know, so if, uh, you know, if everybody starts off at one and the placebo group goes up to 1.1 and you go up to 1.5, you've increased fivefold over the placebo group. But it doesn't mean you've increased 500% over your own baseline. So a lot of times those sorts of numbers, I, I'm hesitant to even look at percentages because those are usually a little bit misleading as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think you see that a lot in even research with things like testosterone and stuff. I think people underestimate how much or overestimate how much a slight testosterone, like free testosterone change is really going to affect you. They see the word testosterone, they assume testosterone, they assume like, oh man, awesome, you know, but it's like, mm -hmm. you have to understand what real, like, there's certain things you could take or you could do even physical activity that may have a slight testosterone adjustment, but that is nowhere near like the doses of if somebody was taking, you know, uh, taking anabolics or something. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Versus an exogenous source. I mean, it, it, we have a test booster on our site and I'm the first one to tell you that it's not, it's not going to replace hormone replacement therapy. If somebody needs it, it's not going to, uh, lead to crazy increases in lean mass, like taking an exogenous, you know, hormone source would be. You know, there's research on testosterone levels where, you know, if you go from the lower end of normal to the middle, you know, upper range of normal, there are marked increases in libido and well-being. That doesn't mean you're going to turn into a monster. That doesn't mean All you're right. going to double your bench press. If that means that you can get an erection and that you feel better and you have less apathy, then that might be worth looking into, uh, too. Um, but I'm not going to be the person that claims that our product will take you up, you know, from a 200 to a 1200. It probably won't do that. Now we have blood work, you know, we have data both in-house and with some of our customers where, you know, there was a, a 25 to 50% increase. And, th and I say those percentages as part of, um, <clears throat> you know, it might go from 400 to 600. So that's a 50% right. increase over baseline. That might offer some some noticeable improvements, like I said, in well-being and libido, but it might not offer a tremendous amount of benefit in terms of, uh, you know, strength output and aggression and those sorts of things. And we don't market it as such. So, so you have to look at, you know, the, um, like you said, the, the benefit of what it's going to come out to compared to, you know, a pharmaceutical or compared to something else. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, and I think that also place the point of of understanding you have to understand understanding you have to understand what you're trying to get out of something because there's a lot of things that you know even there's even things i've written about before that you know if you're if you're operating in a deficit with it or you have an issue related to it then you'll notice a difference but if you're if you're not you know you're just throwing extra of something on top of what you currently are operating normally oh, yeah. isn't necessarily gonna isn't isn't necessarily gonna fix something i think you even see that with like dopaminergic or gaba type things and things like yeah. that um, you know, just cause it, it can work doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work. You know, if person A has a deficiency and they're depressed and they have seasonal affective disorder and all these things, they're going to notice probably a huge difference from something that uh, kind of normalizes them versus if everything's yeah. normal for you, you're not going to take and feel like Superman. Well, yeah, a regular person mega dosing vitamin D who doesn't have a vitamin D, uh, deficiency probably isn't going to notice much, but somebody who's you know, who has a deficiency in magnesium or vitamin D or whatever, you know, some individual ingredients to get back into the normal, normal into the normal absolutely will elicit a, a benefit. You see that a lot with uh, vitamin and mineral supplementation. Some people have mild deficiencies. Athletes generally have more deficiencies, especially in some minerals than, than regular population, you know, things like zinc and magnesium. Um, and as part of a well-rounded you know, singular uh, product or as part of a, you know, if you can buy those ingredients very cheap, it's, it's worth looking into. Um, but you don't want to take something, let's say like a ZMA product and hope that it's going to correct your sleep issues and increase your testosterone because zinc and magnesium help with both of those things. If you're deficient, it might help you a little bit. If you're not deficient, um, they can be useful as part of a, of a greater picture of a greater whole. Uh, but individually, they're not going to do so much. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, you know, that's why, like, being informed and understanding what your goals are is so important. So you don't just start. I think that the, the, reason I'm, the reason I'm even 
you know, I, I try to be really thoughtful about presenting all the facts in regards to any time I talk about any sort of supplement or anything is because it's so easy to just start pulling the string of like <laughs> supplements. And next thing you know, you got a cabinet full of a thousand things and how many of them are actually. Oh, yeah. Well, one you? one thing, you know, so I started the company to make products that I believed in that I wanted to take as an athlete. And even from day one with our initial product, I was big on complete formulas. You know, I don't want to buy a product that I have to add five things to. It's right. just stupid. Um, if it only costs a buck, but you're buying a dollar's worth of raw materials on the side and mixing and matching, now it's not a cost-effective product, and now it's not worth your time. Um, I, as much as I'm known as the supplement guy, and I take a lot of individual ingredients, what I don't take are a lot of individual products. Yeah. Yes, I take our whole line of products, but we don't have 50 things. I don't have 50 bottles sitting in my shelf. I literally have, I literally have, you know, five or six, you know, bottles of pill products for various, you know, benefits, some that I don't take year round. And I have maybe two or three products for performance and recovery and that's it. And I don't have to buy anything else to add to them. Uh, we came out with a really comprehensive organ health and blood sugar, um, uh, assistance product early in this, this year called Morpho Prime. And the reason that I made Prime was because I, I looked at people like my parents, you know, the aging population, or I look at, you know, competitive athletes and bodybuilders who are very health, uh, you know, conscious in terms of their, you know, preventative care. They take a lot of individual ingredients, you know, they take, you know, liver protection and kidney protection, heart protection, and blood pressure protection, and they take all these individual products. And that's, that's great, you know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise the the average person to go out and buy 30 bottles of shit. You know, that's right. just not that's not feasible for the average consumer both in that the average consumer both in terms of cost and in terms of um compliance. Nobody's going to take that many things over the course of a day. So yeah. when we came out with a product like that, it's a very complete product and yes you have to take a few capsules a day, but you don't need to buy 10 bottles of product to get the same health benefits as you would from one of ours. So, you know, in terms of goal yeah. specific we're, we're very open about what each product can do for the consumer. Uh, I'm also a very blunt, I mean, you know me, I'm, I'm a huge blunt, uh, to a fault, honest asshole sort of guy. You know, I talk to people all the time and they say, you know, I'm trying to achieve X, Y, Z benefits. What should I take? And I said, honestly, for those, you're only going to need this one product or maybe these two products because they have everything you need, but you don't need the rest of the line because those are not your goals. If your goal is not performance, then you don't need our pre-workout. If your goal is not recovery, then you don't need our amino formula. If your goal is health and wellness, then yeah, go ahead and use more for prime. Use more for prime. And if, if you're an aging person and you want to have some hormonal benefit, then we can add one product to that. Or if you're if you have chronic anxiety um, or depression or sleep issues, there's a product we can add for that, you know, and that way it's kind of a custom stack for what you're looking to do. But again, it's not forcing an entire line of product. It's not forcing the consumers to, to overspend their dollar. I mean, as much as, as much as I'm running a business, I, I'll, I'll say it till the day I die. I'm not a businessman. I'm a science guy. I'm an athlete. I'm somebody that's passionate about the industry and about what, the consumer can benefit from things, but I'm the last person that's going to try to sell somebody something that they don't need. It's, it's yeah. goal specific and it's budget specific. And, and there needs to be good rationale for why a company is pushing a product on a consumer. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I definitely, I mean, that's one of the things I've definitely respected about any, I mean, you and I have been having conversations about conversations about this stuff for close to 10 years now. And I mean, it's something I've always appreciated is that, you know, and it's part of the reason why, you know, you've grown your company at a very slow, even rate versus like, you know, immediately trying to just sell out and put as many places as possible is because realistically, it's not going to be everywhere. It's not going to be a Sam's Club. It's not going to be the cheapest thing on earth because of what you're trying to do. And I and I respect that a lot. Yeah. And, and um, you know what? And, and the reason that, you know, 90 percent of small businesses fail in in the first year. I started a business with no business experience um, just on a whim based on what I knew to be the, you know, the right thing. And that sounds so cheesy, but I, I literally, I knew that it was the right thing to do. And we've grown the company organically and slowly over the last five and a half years. And we've grown to the level that we're at and been able to expand the line to offer more things to a variety of people. 
because we've created product that was backed by credible research that didn't offer any bullshit marketing claims and product that people actually could feel and tell the difference. We could have made shitty products right out of the gate and dumped a ton of them in the market for huge margins and tried the get rich quick scheme in the beginning. We could have brought in investors and business partners and, and that whole nine. But like I said, that was never the business model. The goal was, the goal honestly was to make product that I wanted to take for me and for my family. And if other people saw the value in it, then great. And thankfully they did. And we've been able to take, you know, the, the success of each individual product that's moved in and slowly been able to re you know, release the next product so that we have an entire line of product to service the needs of pretty much anybody. And that's, that was never the initial goal, but it's definitely been a, a welcomed path for the company. So yeah, it's, it, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, we'll, we'll never be, I always tell people, you know, we're probably never going to be a million dollar company, especially selling direct to consumers, but I don't care. That was never the goal. The goal is to sell the best, uh, noticeable products without being a, a scam artist, without, you know, screwing people over. And if, if it provided, you know, uh, some financial, you know, comfort for us as a family, then that was great. So, yeah, definitely. The uh, last couple of things I wanted to hit on here were, you know, a lot of the people listening, um, you know, with athletes and coaches and even people just trying to work on their own training, you know, recovery is a big part of what people are doing. Um, a lot of people are trying to work through navigating, you know, if they have perhaps a sleep deficit or things like that, you know, trying to get through their training and everything throughout the week. Um, you know, it's also one of the other common things that we haven't discussed and discussed yet is I think a lot of particularly pre-workout supplements will just hyperdose things that have a noticeable feel effect to make you feel like, oh, well, it has to be working. I feel it. Yep. Um, and there's especially if you're, and I've seen this myself, of burning yourself out with too many stimulants, too many things that while the first time or two you use it, you feel awesome you quickly, quickly, it, it, there's a point diminishing return. Oh, absolutely. You know, isn't a good thing. So like, what kind of things do you see that with, with a lot of products? Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the pre-workout specifically. So high dose, cheap stimulants, because stimulants are cheap. And you'll see other things in there that create, uh, you know, flushing or tingling, things like niacin and beta alanine. So you, you dump a bunch of cheap materials in there that hype people up and make their face itch and they think it's doing something. That's kind of, I always joke that that's the, the college bro model. You know, all the bros in yeah. college go, bro, the, it, my face is lit, is lit up and it, my, lit up and it, my scalp itches. It has to be working, bro. You know? Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that those ingredients aren't useful, but you have to look at the totality of a product. So, Yes, we have a pre-workout that has stimulants in it. And yes, if you abuse those stimulants over time, you know, there can be some, at least some negative feedback involved, you know, some, like you said, diminishing returns. There's only so much you can take before your body doesn't respond to it as well. So when I looked at something like a pre-workout, I say, what, what's the goal of a pre-workout? The goal is energy. The goal is focus. The goal is blood flow. The goal is actual physical performance. Uh, you know, the goal is to be in a cognitive state that you focus more during the workout that you are encouraged to do the workout or to stay in the gym longer. When you look at all of those things, even if you take away one of them, it's still a very effective product. You know, if, if somebody takes, you know, let's say our pre-workout chronically and they get used to the caffeine that's to the caffeine that's in there, the product is still going to offer benefit because it does so many other things outside of the chronic stimulation, uh, or, you know, the, the quote unquote, the feel aspect of what people think. Um, now th that being said, you know, we use research supported dosages and as long as somebody isn't abusing stimulants over the course of an entire day, they can probably use our product, you know, four to six days a week and never have habituation occur. Um, you know, it's with chronic overuse. Usually that, that, that sort of thing happens with stimulants. You see kind of a bell curve where, you know, the more you add, the better the person gets. And then the more you add after that, they actually start to get worse again. So you have to look at kind of where that is. Um, stimulants especially are a little weird because no matter what the research says, everybody has their own individual tolerance to stimulants. Yeah. And, and we also looked at, like I said, like the cognitive aspect of things. Yes, caffeine and other stimulants can amp you up and get you energetic. But if you couple, but if you couple that with 
you know, a choline source and uh, a source of L-DOPA and something that increases your catecholamine hormones. Now you have kind of a, you know, I'll call it like a situational cocktail where you're, you are absolutely guaranteed to perform better at the task at hand. Then you include performance ingredients, things like beta alanine and creatine monohydrate and things that increase your capacity to do work. Uh, and then you increase things that decrease, you know, anxiety and increase mood, uh, and, and the willingness to do a workout. So things like theanine and theobromine and, uh, mucinopurians, which is a source of, of L-DOPA. Um, it, it makes sense. The formula makes sense. And you see companies doing pieces of that where it's not necessarily the worst thing in the world, but they're not hitting on all aspects of what the product could do. And therefore the minimal benefits that it does offer will offer will diminish in time. Absolutely. So, you know, high dose stimulants without uh, supporting ingredients. So I'll say that I am a fan of some stimulation. Absolutely. But if you have high dose stimulants, you need supporting ingredients in there like theanine, um, to make sure that the person gets the benefit out of it without anxiety, without, you know, cracking themselves out basically. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something I've gained more appreciation for over time too, is that there's a lot of things that synergistically work well together. And while it can, and there's certain cases where, you know, one individual ingredient jacked really high can have, you know, some good benefit, but you know, while it seems awesome to like, Oh, I'm going to take 600 milligrams of this one stimulant or something. A lot of times, even though it may not be as flashy to the eye, using some synergistic lower dose things like caffeine, uh, caffeine and theanine are one good example of mm -hmm. those things can work. Those things can work really well together to make sure you're not just like blasting your <laughs> steno you know, receptor oh, yeah. stimulants. You know. Yeah, well, and the thing too is is you know like I like I said all along, we're we're a research based company. There has to be a logical reason to include a dose. So when you look at like our pre-workout, we have a very dose um, scoop, essentially. So we tell people that they can take anywhere from one half to one full scoop. The cool thing is, is that every ingredient in there has a range of effective dose. You know, it's not, a, it's not a hard line at five grams or one gram. It might be, you know, two to five grams is effective for most people. So what we do, you know, let's say creatine monohydrate, we put five grams in a scoop. If you take half a scoop to lessen your stimulant effect, you're still getting an efficacious dose of creatine monohydrate that the research shows is beneficial. If we had only put three grams in a scoop, that's still research supported, but now you're only getting a, a gram and a half per half scoop and that scoop, and that is below the effective range. So we did that with all of our ingredients. And that way, if you don't want too many stimulants, um, if you're sensitive to it, if it's later in the day, you know, whatever your rationale may be, all the other supporting ingredients are still in effective half scoop doses, whether that be a tolerance issue or a body weight dependent issue. You know, you know, somebody who's a 120 pound female, half scoop is a full dose for them. Somebody right. that's a 250 pound male, a full scoop is a full dose for them. Um, yeah. Another example, so our amino uh, recovery product called Synthogen, the research is pretty clear on uh, amino acids, especially things like leucine, uh, recovery agents like HMB and carnitine tartrate. The research is very clear that you need X amount per X amount of body weight. Okay. So what we designed it for was instead of just saying, you know, take one to three scoops, however you feel like, cause that's what these other companies, that's what these other companies do, especially with amino acid products, take two to three scoops. Well, well Joe, what the hell does that mean? Why two to three? Right. So ours is designed that one scoop for 100 pounds of body weight. And that's based on the research. So it's custom dosing that, you know, you're getting the proper amount. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you take two scoops. If you weigh hundred pounds, you take one scoop. And now there's no guesswork involved. Yeah. Um, I think we hit on a lot of really good things. You know, I, uh, I want to give obviously you an opportunity to share some of the things that you're doing with your company. And then I think we, you know, no matter what somebody's interested in doing, I think a lot of the stuff we covered will help people navigate looking at dietary supplement labels, looking at ingredients lists, looking at research and making sure all those things match up. So, um, where can, if people are more interested in some of the stuff you do, um, in your company uh, and just what you're doing in general, what can, uh, where can they find that? 
Yeah, so our, our website is mntakeover.com. Our tagline is Join the Takeover. So the company is Morphogen Nutrition. And I should have said this in the beginning. So Morphogen Nutrition is a long, complicated word, and I, and I understand that. Uh, it literally means creation of change. Morpho and gen means creating your own change. Uh, and on the cellular level, a morphogen compound is something that tells cells to undergo a certain reaction. So to me, so to me, even from day one, the creation of the company name had to mean something. It had to be a pure reason that we started the company. So morphogennutrition.com or mntakeover.com. Uh, I am morphogen Ben across all social media platforms. Uh, I'm on Facebook as Ben Hartman. It's pretty easy to find me. They can link up with you on there. Um, I'm also very accessible, whether that be uh, contacting me through the webpage or through social media. Uh, I'm very, very good about talking to people, not just about our product line, but about you know the industry in general. If they have questions about a certain ingredient that we might not use, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, if they have ingredient or an ingredient, excuse me, if they have a question about, you know, bodybuilding training or powerlifting or whatever, I'm happy to, you know, answer that based on my, you know, in the trenches experience as well as my, you know, focused coursework and, and career endeavors that I've undertaken. So undertaken. So I'm, I'm happy to discuss that with anybody. Um, as for what we have coming up, uh, we're going to continue to expand the line for the rest of 2017. My goal by January of 2018 or maybe February is to have a full line of product where we don't have any holes in the line. So we have, you know, a pre-workout, we have a recovery drink, we have uh, a fat loss product, we have a nutritive product, a health product, you know, a stress product, you know, all these, all these avenues where anybody that has a major goal, we have a, a, a product that fulfills that niche. Um, and then from there, it's a matter of expanding the line in terms of flavor offerings or potentially even size, you know, unit size, that sort of thing. Great. Yeah, thanks for all that info. And I'll make sure that when we post this episode um, at peakmentalperformance.org, I'll make sure to link to some of those things too. So uh, thanks for chatting today. Um, you know, you're busy, and it was, a, it was a really good conversation. It's even good just reminders for me with stuff as I navigate, both I think, the gate, what I'm trying to put out there for people and helping people, you know, like, we both, I think, have the same perspective of whether it's training or nutrition or supplementation or whatever. It's like, I'm not trying to tell, I'm not trying to make the decisions for people. I'm trying to show them how they can come to the con best conclusions for them. So I think this is absolutely agreed. Yeah, that. for sure. Yeah, I, I'm, I would much rather have, you know, have the ability to give people information so that they can make an intelligent and informed and logical decision than have somebody just trust in what I'm saying and have me give them a, a a blank, you know, a black and white answer. That's not, that's not my style. I want somebody to understand why they're making that decision and why it might be the best decision for them. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Ben. It was a great conversation and uh, we'll definitely, uh, you know, if there's an opportunity that we have another topic we'd like to discuss or people enjoy what we talked about today, we'll definitely have to do it again soon. I'm down. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, some additional resources if you're interested. Uh, ben and I had mentioned examine.com. It's a great resource online for looking up research on different nutritional supplements and nutrition in general. They compile research and do a really good job at noting context and limitations. I uh, highly recommend taking a look at that if you're ever interested in learning more about supplements and ingredients and things like that. Um, in addition to that, I had mentioned CBD oil dosing. I just recently wrote a short article on that for the peakmentalperformance.org website. So if you go to that website and go under new content, you'll be able to see that. And uh, it's some pretty interesting information I put together on uh, why I think CBD or cannabidiol is an incredible tool, but I do not purchase it um, for use and, and kind of the reasons why. And then lastly, um, a reminder that we have some information on Kratom and its applications on our website and the ability to uh, purchase that from Crack and Kratom, uh, one, of our, one of our affiliates for the podcast, and it's an opportunity to support the podcast and to take advantage of that. Uh, one of the few tools that I really think uh, is, is worth constant application depending on your situation. So um, if you have any other questions, always feel free to shoot me an email at joeshalero at gmail.com or visit the peakmentalperformance.org website.